Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Fife Property Show. Morning, Perry. You're joining us this morning. We are going to be talking about selling your rental home and how to plan the perfect exit if you are selling without losing your tenant or your income. Now, this is something that I've seen quite a lot lately. Jim, you'll be aware of that as well. And yourself as well, Perry. Have you seen a lot of, of landlords and things coming forward who are selling off their properties or part of their portfolios? Well, like, Mark, next to this. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> It's like, you know, the Scottish government has put so, so much draconian legislation in, and then you can see the UK government and the English government coming next and the draconian legislation yeah. they're going to be putting in. Um, it's like a mass exodus for uh, yeah. private landlords. Yeah. And yay, everybody shouts, all the broke people, all the people that are tenants, but you don't realise that the fact that there is nowhere for you to go after yeah. this. Once yeah. the private landlord sells up, there's no council housing, there's no social housing being built. That's the, It's... 70% almost sold off since the Thatcher era in the 1980s. And the Thatcher era actually built more social housing in Scotland than the, the Scottish government did. I know, it's when you first brought that to my attention. Oh, I thought, that, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is very damning and very yeah. revealing about a party, you know, about how they've mismanaged uh, the social housing and affordable housing uh, policy for the last 10 or 15 years in Scotland. Um, but it's right across the UK. It's rife. Um, yeah. And this is why we're talking about it. It's about planning yeah. the perfect exit without losing your actual tenant or your income as well and making sure you can sell your house and your rental home on to the next person. So it actually sustains the tenancy for the current person in situ. The last yes. thing they want is actually to have to up sticks and leave their house because you're selling. And that was the biggest thing for the government. They always said you never really had security of tenure because the landlord could sell any time. So we really want the landlord to keep you in there as long as possible and keep the property as long as possible, except what you do shouts more loudly, I can't hear what you say. Mm. That's a very good expression, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I think it's like you say, although obviously rents have been going through the roof and yields are getting higher and, and there's a massive demand from tenants, many landlords are choosing to sell their rental homes. And for some, it's maybe in part, it's maybe as part of the long term plan. Uh, but for others, it's a reaction against the changing rules and the taxes and things that have been uh, coming into play over the last uh, year or, or the last couple of years, really, to be fair. Um, so even so, uh, not every landlord who's selling um, up is getting out. I mean, so I have seen people selling certain parts of their portfolio, but not actually getting out the, 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 the private sector completely. Uh, and some are using the climate of stalling house prices and rocketing rents and uh, using it to level up uh, the proposals to reset their buy to let business for the future. Mm -hmm. um, but what, I mean, what about you, Jim? What's, what's your view on this at the moment? I mean, I, I know what it is, but for the name out there. <laughs> <laughs> buy, the edited if, version. <laughs> buy, buy, buy. If the numbers yeah. are right, it's buy every single time. There is no discrimination. I have no discrimination about what makes money and what doesn't make money. If it makes money, it makes absolute sense to invest in that sector. It makes absolute sense to invest in that type of property, whatever that type of property is. We talk about that a lot in the Wealth Creation Show all yeah. the time. Now... I mean, you know, are you hanging up your landlord hat for good? That's what we've got to ask everybody out there. Yeah, are you yeah. swapping for an older home for an energy efficiency, a modern one? It, to me, that's not the right thing to do. It's actually just modernise what you've got now because yeah. you keep a steady flow of income as well. Or are you converting to a company for tax advantages or easy inheritance tax planning, which I have been doing over the last five years, moving quite a lot of my stock into a limited company, having to take the hit for the capital gains sometimes, and also having, well, most of the time I've been getting away with the ADS because I've been transferring and buying six or more six properties at, time, at the yeah. same time. So that avoids additional dwelling supplement, which is the second home tax. Now, this just let me get my head around that. So the government says, and this is a political point, we're going to put 6% and we believe it will stop landlords actually buying properties and taking them away from first-time buyers. Okay, so we'll encourage landlords with that are going to buy six or more properties at the same time <laughs> and we'll give them no DEDS then. That, that doesn't make sense at all yeah. then, does it? No, it's no, like, no, so no, we'll, we'll, we'll castigate the people that buy one at a time 
but we'll let everybody buy six or more at a time and get away with scot free. And we'll not discourage them at all for taking six or more at a time out of the first time buyer market. Which which makes it difficult for the for the majority because the majority of landlords only have one or two properties. Do you know what I mean? And there, there, there's... So, Richard, this actually tells me this is a tax raising. This is a tax raising legislation. Yeah. It was nothing to do with first time buyers. It was nothing to do with putting more stock into the homes. It was all about raising more tax. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. Because if that was the case, you would have stopped the six or more properties being done. The UK government would have stopped that as well. It, so the benefit more, would have been reversed, you would have thought, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's not about encouraging people to put more properties back in for first time buyers. Yeah. It's about raising more tax for the coffers for the Scottish government and for the UK government as well. That's mm -hmm. what the ADS legislation, the additional development supplement legislation, is all about raising more money for tax so they can spend it on something which is completely different to the homeless to help the homeless or anything else. That money will go somewhere else. Just like the road tax, it goes, you know, only 20% of the road tax actually money gets spent on roads and traffic mm -hmm. and transport. The other 80% goes somewhere else. So the people driving cars think they're actually paying for the roads. But in fact, you're not at all. I will announce my candidacy for Prime Minister. <laughs> First Minister <laughs> next week. I was just thinking that that soapbox was just getting an awful lot bigger all of a sudden. <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, whatever whatever your reasons are for selling, if you're a landlord or an investor and things, there are a lot of things to think about before you do that. Um, I mean, is selling the best move for you? You need to think about what your property is going to be worth. The the cost and the tax implications. A lot of people don't think about capital gains and things when they're when they're they're considering this option. Also, when should you tell your tenant? Do you, when should you inform your tenant? Are you keeping your tenant in place? What's your strategy there? No. Um, can, should you sell to another landlord and keep the property in the private sector? Or are you going to be looking at new home buyers and things and target them because possibly they'll pay more for the property? Mm -hmm. Do you know there's a lot of things to take into consideration? I thought Jim was going to jump in there. It's fine. No, um, so, yeah, so today, anyway. I'm busy trying to get a live stream on Instagram. Oh, you still <laughs> right, okay. We're live, well, that's a good point. We're live streaming today, obviously, on all platforms. Jim's just trying to hook up live. So please keep it interactive, guys, if you're watching and have any questions. If you are in that position at the moment and you are looking to sell your, your property or part of your portfolio or anything and on the fence and not sure what to be thinking about in order to make the right decision, jump in the comments, ask any questions, message us direct out with um, if there's a rerun or whatever, and we will be happy to help in any way we can, or point you in the right direction if we can to someone who can help you. Because there is a lot to consider, as I say, there's a lot of things that I just went through there. But today we are going to explore whether selling your rental home would be a costly mistake or whether it's the best thing you can do for you. And it is sometimes really on an individual basis. And there is a lot of people that make the rash decision because they are being forced into, the, obviously forced into that position because of what's been changing in the in the sector at the moment in terms of, like I say, tax yeah, implications. Yeah, yeah. And, Can I quickly uh, just recap? Yeah. If you're asking any questions, please feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Uh, we can if we can answer them because we're doing it at the same time because we're covering this subject because this is all scripted. These shows, but we actually are lived from there. Yeah. Um, we can answer that question there and then. However. We will come right back to the very end and list through the questions again and actually be able to go over it. Um, mm -hmm. This is live streamed. It will be saved. So it's on there for you to just rewind because there is somebody that says, I've just joined. Can you recap? But, you know, yeah. really everything just came off the top of my head. So I can't <laughs> even remember what I said. Um, <laughs> that's literally it. Yeah. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to see now or anything like that. It's just like, it just, no, we, we, it just comes out. We do have a pointers to follow through that. Yeah, we, we people call it verbal diarrhea, but it's, <laughs> but it's uh, but sometimes it just comes out, and I have to make a point at that time. Anyway, um, yeah. what's the but, first things we should be? Yeah, I think about, um, the first thing that you should really, obviously, be thinking about is is should you actually sell your rental home, and that will be the first thing that will be on everybody's minds when they come to this kind of realization. Things are changing, and they're kind of on the fence, and, and should you actually be doing that? I mean, What's unless you're. I mean, for me, I mean, unless you're selling your rental property as part of a long term plan, I mean, perhaps somebody's retiring. You know, there's many reasons why people might be doing it. They might be retiring, they might be wanting to mm -hmm. release funds. There could be a life circumstance change that's kind of impacted them. But it's worth a quick game of devil's advocate and weighing it all up, I think, 
Um, you know, if you're selling because of changes in the letting laws, that's one thing. Um, if it's because interest rates, obviously, that's a completely other one and ever changing. Yeah. And by what you've just said there, Jim, as well, tax policies, they're ever changing and sometimes don't make sense either. So actually, a landlords may be in a situation where they don't fully understand the implications of that. So again, it's important to get there was good consideration to that. Years ago, we had mm -hmm. things like the wear and tear allowance, which was 10% of your top line rent, which was mm -hmm. able to deduct right off your tax. Like a tax credit in comparison to what it is now for Section 24, which is the deduction at low rate, low rate interest um, mm -hmm. on mortgages. Um, mm -hmm. that's what the EDS was, you know, and sorry, the the the, um, uh, hope the Furnishings Act, um, it, it did that as well. Um, there was other ones as well. Um, capital gains was on a capital allowance basis. So it was on a year, the number of years you've held the property, you got more exemptions. So in other words, I was up to 60% allowance on capital gains for most of my properties. And then turned around and went, I tell you what, we're just going to change it. We're just going to change it to a flat 18 or 28%. Thanks for that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. wiped out all my all my allowances and all my all, everything just overnight and then they changed the rules and th then that made it really difficult for me to be able to transfer to a limited company without huge capital gains implications mm -hmm. um, and that's where uh, that's where one in four landlords are predicted to have actually been stopped in their tracks um, um actually building a portfolio or getting any further or even being in financial difficulty because of the section 24 uh, low rate deduction of mortgage interest uh, coming into play and, and i do know a landlord right now that's actually in that position um and you know to a degree i'm in it as well i mean i've got um i've got one of which is in our name uh, we've actually we've, technically we've had to pay tax but we've actually broken even wait a minute so i'll say that again i've not actually made any profit but we've actually still had to pay tax yeah the way it works out and then I did have other things as well. And then I, and then even after I've had to pay the tax, um, it's 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 gonna it's just gonna carry on to next year and be exactly the same thing again. I had another mm -hmm. scenario where I actually I was actually gonna be not paying tax, but there was an allowance left over from the mortgage interest, which you can carry to the next year. But in the situation it uh, is that it's actually quite difficult to actually be able to offset that tax credit to the next year. I, I don't know if anybody knew that. You could actually you could actually take that excess tax credit if you are in that position and carry it on to the next year. Um, I did say to my accountant at the time, um, is it possible to actually is it possible to actually put deferred income in and actually do that? He says, but if you put deferred income in, that will push you up to the forty percent bracket or the higher mm -hmm. rate bracket. Therefore, you'll pay the higher rate tax element, and you won't actually get that as a deduction uh, the mm -hmm. way it works out. I went, okay, so that doesn't make sense either. So you're kind of, for, for most landlords in that situation, where they've built all their portfolio in their own name and they're actually in the higher rate tax band, they're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea right now. And, and I literally mean the devil as in the government and the taxation system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, you know, it's either that, it's, it's sink or swim now. And mm -hmm. a lot are actually offloading because of that, because it's like, yeah. I can't see any way out of it because... Mm -hmm. They, do, they they will have to pay for ones that have held for a long time. They will have huge capital gains tax to pay. So if they try to transfer that to a limited company, they will have to pay the capital gains tax on it because the limited yeah. companies are an entity in its own right. Now, there is yeah. one proviso. You need to speak to an accountant on this. I know I'm an accountant, but um, I, I, I don't know the exact law and legislation on this. But there is a situation where you can transfer the whole lot and a winner from your name to the limited company. Um, and the capital gains can actually be rebased at that same value that you bought it for originally. So therefore, you'll not have capital gains on yourself. However, you're passing all these gains to that company. Um, you're actually losing all the benefit of that that you've actually accrued all these years in, the, in that lift that you've got. Fair enough, you own the limited company, but it'll be taxed at a different rate as well. And there'll be implications of that. Plus the fact that you've got mortgages on them, you have to you have to then end all the mortgages in your name and then start a limited company mortgage. So you'll have to mm -hmm. get a corporate entity more than likely to actually be able to mortgage them if you've got 10 or more properties, because most mortgage lenders like Birmingham Midshires and the, um, we're maybe getting ahead of ourselves here, Richard, um, and the mortgage work, um, they will only allow you up to 10 buy-to-let mortgages or buy-to-let properties. Um, that's mm -hmm. all they'll allow you for. And the rest of the lenders like uh, all the more than that, which are big, They'll do big portfolios, but they're actually doing them on a, a higher return uh, level. So they actually want more money out of you. 
uh, for that reason because they see it as taking a bigger risk. The higher risk know. factor. No, it's not really. They're just taking advantage because they mm. know you've got nowhere else to go in terms of getting the funding. And, and yeah. that's the way it works. So it's it's like saying it's like saying you're better you're better with having sixty percent of of the income rather than a hundred percent of nothing, because it's not yeah. going to happen without them. So you know you, you're going to have to do a deal at some point in time if that's the case. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, Jim. I, I, obviously, in conversations, you you always refer to your accountant, and those who watch regularly will know that you are an accountant by trade. But you use an independent accountant still, and the as the importance of that to people. I mean when it comes to tax implications and, and how to do things properly, um, especially if you're running a bigger portfolio, do you think it's important to have an independent accountant and, or financial advisor or somebody advising you on, on tax? I'll, I'll tell you why I use an accountant. Because the rate I get paid and the rate the accountant gets paid, I get paid a lot more than the accountant. Yeah. So if I'll go to set your time for value. If I'm, and I can make more per hour than the accountant can. So if I can make more per hour than the accountant can, and I've only got 160 hours in the week to use for how I use it, then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try and do the accounts myself for for things that could be easily done by my my accountant, um, which is which is basically the statutory accounts and the taxation calculation. And mm-hmm. um, if there is the good thing is, um, you know. Colin at Parsh and Boyd and leaving uh, that is like so. If you're wanting a really good accountant for for property, it really is Colin at Parsh and Boyd and leaving um, in Glenrothes because uh, I put him over the I, I put him over the racks with with, with all the questions I have. <laughs> Quite believe so, it. <laughs> so he's he they the these tech accounts are, are mainstream cottage industry accountants, but because I've asked him so many questions over the years about what I can do, what I can't do. And how is it possible and what extra do I need to put towards this in order to get just under the threshold so I'm paying minimum? And what 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 contribution do I need to put to my pension to bring myself back down to the basic rate payer again from a higher rate taxpayer when I'm making a certain amount of income? Because it's tax efficient. Um, mm-hmm. Then I go to him all the time to work that out for me. I just let him work that out. I say, this is a scenario. What, how would it work out and what would I do and how would I get that? Now, it's not actually all the time. To, a lot of people actually. Somebody actually said this morning on TikTok um, about the one percent says, "But you'll be more. You'll be in more than a hundred thousand a year." And I'll tell you, I am not. <laughs> There's no way I want to earn a hundred thousand a year because I'll be paying a huge amount of tax on that. <laughs> And it's like, and it's like there's, no way. Way. there's no way. There's no way I'm wanting to pay that amount of money on 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 tax on that type of income. I I work it out so basically, it's tax efficient. And then any excess I, I run from normal day to day over and above what I'm getting, I'll either go into my pension or I'll go back into the company as a as a yeah. director's loan. So it's there for me, but it will earn more money. So it's a tax efficient way every single year to take money out of your company, but put it back in as a director's loan. So the company still has working capital, but you've more or less you've more or less made that money tax efficient in how you've done it every year, taking a, taking advantage of all the proper tax planning measures that are in place in order to do that. We'll come on to that anyway. Yeah, no, I think tax is a big part of obviously what you need to, that, that's driving this this whole should I be selling my, my uh, rental property anyway. So, I mean, it's good to cover that and get your insight. The landlord exodus it really has exacerbated, uh, exacerbated the shortage of rental homes. It's caused rents to rise and it's uh, increasing yields uh, for landlords who want to stay in the private sector. Uh, Perry, what about like house prices? Yeah, I mean, house prices have stalled slightly. I mean, we spoke about that the other day, Jim, didn't we? Um, and now many are not as profitable, perhaps, for landlords as they previously yeah. were. Um, and some of them are finding that it is the time to sell. Um, and as Jim says, the way that the taxes are all set up for those landlords in the norm, maybe have between one and three in a portfolio, actually, they're the ones that are getting hit hardest. So, you know, for them, it's making sense. Um so, you know, for them, it's time to take the opportunity and remove themselves from the market, really, and get a buy-to-let bargain, perhaps, you know, in, in oh, regards yeah. to their sale and stepping out, which is unfortunate because it does then have other issues in regards to housing. Um, but if you're planning to reinvest elsewhere as well, I think it's important to bear in mind that pensions have struggled to perform as well, just with the global markets the way they are at the moment. Um, properties in some areas are not performing as well as perhaps had been anticipated. Shares 
the old cryptocurrency <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. has been a bit has been a bit of a disaster. Um, and the foreign exchanges are more volatile as well. You know, watching the news yesterday, another American bank having to be kind of bailed out by Citibank, etc. Um, that, you know, that's a bit of a concern. Yeah. You'll know this, Perry. You'll know this over the years. But mm -hmm. but before this was all public about banks bailing banks out and all the rest of it, this was this is quite commonplace for banks to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they 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 bail each other out all the time. It's just that you never got to know about it in public, and it's been going on for years and years and years. So it's not as if the you know people you know the henny penny. It's like oh my god, the world's falling in. What will I do? <laughs> that sort of attitude. <laughs> Again, it's like it, it's like that that this is normal this is normal for banks to bail each other out because this is just because they're lending some banks get to a lending capacity where it puts them a wee bit under pressure so the other banks go okay then that's fine we'll just loan you the money to let you get that back once investors come back in or they put their money back in then we'll just take that back out when it's necessary that's normal business lending and normal day-to-day uh, -day business it's not the collapse of the banking industry like what the media says Exactly. Um, and you're, you're totally right, Jim, it is standard. And, you know, I was financial sector for 15 years, as you know, and I saw that many times um, because actually the banks that are putting that money over to the other bank that's struggling, it's in their interest, too, because they need that high street bank to perform. They need them yeah. to be in situ because it's all that whole global exchange of money. And it's really important for that to kind of continue yeah. so that all of the other banks that are not in that particular issue or situation at that moment still can flourish and benefit and have a good business. Um, yeah. I think as long as along with that as well, though, you know, as part of the government proposals as well with the EPC, so the environmental performance of properties as well, that's changing. You yeah. know, so ratings of C for every rental home, that's a big step up for some landlords who perhaps, you know, I know it won't impact you, Jim, because you've always kind of renovated yours to a high standard, but not every landlord has been in that position because they've maybe just started out doing building portfolios. So that really yeah. impa impacts them. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm seeing if I can get funding for a mini nuclear plant installment um, so I could actually just make all my, because apparently nuclear is now being classified, reclassified as net zero. Um, so if I can put a mini nuclear plant in uh, locally and actually be able to feed that into the tariff and then say that's feeding all my houses in terms of, <laughs> I'm only kidding. I know. <laughs> that's the stupidity of it, eh? I'm like, how on earth? Come on, let's be serious. How on earth is nuclear net zero? Uh, footprint, eh? You've got exactly. you, you've got spent fuel. It gets it gets buried somewhere and comes back, and everybody gets toxified in years to come. This is a film. This is a film script coming to fruition at some point <laughs> in the future. Exactly. I'll be driving past your house on Monday. Jack. Um, it'll be like the old ready break house with, with the glow all around it. <laughs> with the glow around it. <laughs> but but yes, yeah. I think that thing. You know, the environmental impact is one big thing as well, but. You know, there is talk of maybe there being some financial incentives put in place for landlords, you know, to help the cost of those upgrades. Yeah. But, you know, is that going to come forward? There'll have to be something in place. Like you say, the, the minimal EPC banding is going to be CE come 2025 uh, for all um, new tenancies and then existing tenancies will be 2028. Um, the national average for an EPC is around about D. Um, so a lot of properties won't be it won't be too difficult to get to the sea, but there's a lot out there that will be very difficult. And mm -hmm. do you know a lot of older properties and things where they will need some sort of financial incentive to help them get to that that uh, level. Mm -hmm. um, so as as a really important factor, and a lot of people when they're buying now, it's a big it's a big part of their buying um, strategy to look at the the EPC rating and think mm -hmm. ahead. Like yeah, yeah. I'm going to need to either improve this or think about the costs involved to improve it. To be in line with the legislation when it comes into force. I mean, mm -hmm. um, EPC level C is not that easy to get. Maybe in rural properties, and do you know I do a lot yeah. of like older cottages and things, and I just think, God, mm -hmm. how are we ever going to get to that? But, and that's a big factor for some some landlords and things when they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think well, your heart might tell you to sell, but I think it makes sound financial sense to decide with your head, doesn't it? And I think it's about getting those facts. And we often talk yeah. about clickbait news and, and headline news etc but they're not always factual and applicable to yourself so I think it's really important that you do get that sound advice from someone if you're unsure of what to do with it in regards to your next steps isn't it but I think most digging landlord, a little deeper doing your most research most landlords actually make a decision based on emotion yeah, yeah. So it, because, and they make a decision based on the herd uh, mentality so yeah. if everybody on their uh, 
their property page or their investors group or anything like that says, you know, I'm excellent because of this, I'm excellent because of that, I'm excellent. They hear all these horror stories at once and then they think, maybe I should be excellent as well. It's that flight or fight response. Yeah. And immediately go into that mode. And everything, what happens is when you say, maybe I should exit, we're going to talk about mindset on the Wealth Creation Show, actually, yeah. four ways to, uh, your mindset to work on that, create wealth on um, Monday at uh, 12.30, Richard. Yeah. But this is important. So what happens is in that situation where you hear everybody else saying that and you say, maybe I should do this as well, what happens is your logical side of your brain then goes away and looks for uh, evidence to actually support that argument you've put in your mind about maybe I should exit as well, because then you start to see, oh, well, because of the tax, oh, well, because the legislation is getting more difficult, oh, well, because of this. And when in actual fact, uh, this side of your mind where it says maybe I should stay, is completely forgotten about. Mm -hmm. I always, I usually say it, typically, this is how your mind works. Um, when you go and buy a car, you think no one else has got your type of car on the road. And then when you get on the road, it's like, holy shit, everybody else has got one. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's like, not unique at all. And it's because now you're focused on you've got that car and you start to see that car appear everywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's why that's what focus is all about. Once you get in the flow and definitely and you get focus, you can make anything happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Literally. I, I thought it was quite interesting because I was looking at the Americans and the British <laughs> and the British. Uh, the Americans tell their children, here's a classic, the, 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 I'm, I'm going to diverse here. The Americans tell their children, you could be president one day. And everybody believes that in America. Whereas in Britain, what we tell our children is, nah, that's not for the likes of you. Just stay in your lane, pal. Yeah, <laughs> that's sure. literally what happens. Uh, and that's a completely different mindset. And we're, again, we're going to talk about that on Monday. Uh, but yeah. listen, listen, what are the costs and the tax breaks for selling up then? Richard. So as well as obviously like you, you've got your estate agent and legal fees and things, you'll need to pay capital gains like we just covered there, Jim, mm -hmm. uh, on the profit when you sell your rental property. Uh, unless you own it in a company and leave the funds in the actual business itself. So yeah. before you jump in, work out how much your selling up costs will be uh, to you. And that's a really important thing because people think, oh, I'll just sell up. And it's like, well, you've no thought about you're going to have obviously your capital gains. You're going to have to pay your your, your solicitor. You're going to have to pay your estate agent to sell it. And do you know I mean? there's there's a lot involved in that. And you need to really need to think of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. uh, some landlords have decided to swallow up their capital gains tax bill. Um, but if you're planning to reinvest, then think about whether you can, you can recoup the amount that you pay. So that's something to consider as well. Mm -hmm. And when you're working on your capital gains tax, you can take off the costs of selling and buying the property, like stamp duty, surveyors, conveyancing, and estate agencies, commissions and things as well. So what happens so with capital happens gains? Now. Capital gains is uh, currently right now, just till the end of this tax year, 12,300. I think mm -hmm. it's actually going to be halved. I think it's going down to 6,000 or thereabouts, but somebody else can correct me on that. Um, once you sell your property, you must notify um, the uh, um, within from the completion date, you must notify HMRC within thirty days um, that you've actually you've actually sold it. Okay, and, and the reason for that is because you will then have to pay a nominal nominated amount of tax based on the capital gains calculation. So they no longer let you wait till your tax return goes in at the end of the financial year. You know, the fall in January later, uh, they want it within thirty days now. The capital gains uh, tax element, and if you don't do that, you will be fined. Even if you miss that by one day and have a valid excuse, they will fine you because they find me. Yeah, no, that's a good point, Jim. And I think maybe people think, oh, if it's only a day, it doesn't matter to them. And you need to be doing that within the time. So set them excuse out. That's yeah. it. You can also claim back the costs of any improvements that didn't qualify as allowable expenses eh, and your reg regular tax return, and you get a personal tax-free capital gains allowance of. 12,300, Jim, is yep. that right, yeah. per year? And jointly owned properties, um, every owner can use their allowances at the same sale. So that's like if you're a, if you're a married couple and you've got two people, you both have the the allowance. If you, just quickly, um, we're on the 18th of March, mm -hmm. uh, the end of the tax year is the 5th of April. Uh, you still have time, if you can sort this out, if you've got a property in your own name and you possibly want to remortgage it in the future, 
and you you have that 12,300 allowance and that's maybe what you've made so far and you do want to transfer that to a limited company, you've still got time to possibly do that within that time period. Um, if you've got a lawyer that could quickly turn things around and you could transfer it, that way you'll get the 12,300 allowance. If you've got a spouse, you can use their allowance as well because you can gift uh, a certain percentage on the day of transaction just before it's a due to sell yeah. to the your limited company and you could do it for it's called love favor and affection so it's free if, it's, if you've got a spouse and you can use their 12,300 as well which is gives you a 24,600 allowance so if you've got a property like that and you want to transfer it you can alleviate that card against tax position you've transferred it to your limited company and you could actually do that um when you're transferred to a limited company as a director's loan yeah. if you're doing that and therefore all that money has now been created as tax free because mm -hmm. you've you've done that whereas if you leave it in your own name right now i i do believe i'm trying to find out what the what the rates are i'm sure it's coming down to um uh, six thousand uh, from the next tax year onwards um but but for some reason i'm on the hmrc website and i actually don't actually show you anything like that capital gains rates they just show you 28 um percent on residential properties the higher rate but they don't actually show you that. They don't actually tell you much about the allowances. Um, they're maybe trying to. They're maybe trying to not tell anybody in advance so much about it, and um, just in case they actually decide to do this, because they're mm. going to hit everybody later on. That's mm. what they want to do. They want more money in. Let's be honest. So they're they're going to reduce it, and then they're going to reduce it again, and eventually, capital gains allowances for for residential property won't exist. They'll be taken away yeah. completely because it's just it, it's almost like selling off the silver. This is what it's like. UK PLC is now selling off the silver. And I used to talk about how companies, you know, manufacturing companies had huge amounts of land and they used to sell tranches of land to house building companies and they'd get money into their coffers. They'd spread it out to their uh, distribution, to their, their dividends and their shareholders. Uh, and then but they actually wouldn't reinvest anything in plant and machinery. And then next minute, you know, 10 years later, they're out of business because they've sold the silver off and they don't have enough money to put, put back into the business. Yeah, they've never thought about that about putting it back in. That I could I could count so many uh, local businesses which I've been involved in have actually done that, and that's what's caused that problem selling of the silver. So be careful, um, be careful yeah. what you try to do and understand your tax plan and how that would go. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, your your capital gains allowances and obviously you, your tax year. I mean, if you're selling more than one rental property at a time, it could be better maybe spreading it out um, for the sales over different tax years and yeah. then that way you could use your annual capital gains allowance each time mm -hmm. so if, you've got, if you're able to do that if, i mean like i say it's, it's on an individual basis but if you're if you've got the option to do that do that and spread it out over different tax years if you've got a bigger portfolio and you're deciding to to sell off more than one property um so yeah so given all that selling your property could run into the tens of thousands i mean really and, and people might not realize that and it's essential to have like a crystal clear picture of all the costs involved and avoid any nasty surprises and later regrets. Do you know what I mean? Because you will regret it if you decide to sell and think, God, why have I done this? It's cost me a fortune. I didn't didn't think about this. I didn't know about this. I didn't speak to the right people to find out first. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, think I, think I, could, I could relate to that. I could relate to that. You know yourself, but you know, I suppose I was I actually sold, but then I just reinvested the money back in again. I was never yeah. about selling. And actually just go and spend oh i could get a ferrari it's like i was never i was never like that it's funny how you it's funny how you put your voices on it's like oh i can get a ferrari <laughs> um but but that you know that i was never about that i was all mm. about taking it selling it uh making it the best advantage of the tax position and then reinvesting it in something else again um in order to in order to, for it to make even more money than it did mm. before so it was never about you know, spend it on something which was a to me is a, a liability and and it's just a it's, it's just a wasted asset. It's mm -hmm. not even an asset really. It just cars just cost you money all the time. So you get something that's really tax efficient in order to to be better. But again, that's another story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that uh, the next really important thing if you're selling a rental property is what do you do with the tenant? When do you tell the tenant? Mm -hmm. And I mean, legally speaking. You can sell your rental property to another investor without actually saying anything to your tenant at all and the tenancy simply continues and it's up to the new landlord to serve notice uh, and do the change ownership and things to, to do all yeah. that yeah. at that end so you can do it like that i think it would kind of say if you've got a tenant and you've you've got a long-standing tenant and a good relationship you you would always maybe notify them in my opinion i think that's the best thing to do well, i think well, that 
as an estate agent, as an estate agent, the first thing I typically usually do is I'll say to the landlord, look, we'll try and sell it with the tenant in situ yeah. uh, and see if somebody will pick it up with the tenant in situ. However, you have to be aware and you have to sell, tell your tenant at some point in time that possibly that might not that be might the not case. Yeah. Um, so the best case scenario is actually try and sell it with the tenant in situ. Um, however, if you have a tenant in situ, you're limiting your market when you're selling. So mm -hmm. therefore, you're in a position where your, your number of buyers has now gone down by about I would, I would reckon they've probably gone down by about 90%. Mm. The number of buyers is it's currently just gone right down by 90% because you're trying to sell it with the tenant with in situ. Tenant, yeah. It's unfortunate, but that's that's the scenario. Your 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 buyers have actually disappeared as a result. Yeah. Um, whereas if you've, if you've not got and you've got vacant possession, yeah, you'll always get a lot more buyers. Therefore, potentially you get a lot more a higher price. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of investors actually downgrade the property by twenty percent, and you're like, well, well, wait a minute, it's it's still got the value. But the problem is, They're you've got a restricted market in terms of the number yeah. of buyers, so they won't actually they won't actually the twenty percent off. There's there's no it's not like in America where you have forced appreciation, um, mm -hmm. and forced appreciation in America is designed because the reason that they can do it in America is because the house is actually allocated as a rental property under the law. Mm -hmm. Like what you have serviced accommodation, like what you have student lets with HMOs granted yeah. to them. They are, that's where forced depreciation on an HMO. If you had, if you didn't have an HMO, a, a house and multiple occupation license, or possibility on a, a house in St Andrews, that would be significantly less in value because of that. But because of what that it does, it causes forced depreciation because if you can rent it out for five thousand pound a week, you know, and I'm gonna that's an exaggeration. Yeah. Um, but if you can rent it for five thousand pound a week, then essentially that's two hundred and fifty grand a year. Mm. Is it no? I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Holy shit! <laughs> 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 but you see what I mean. So if you can yeah. earn two hundred fifty thousand pound a year, your your five hundred thousand pound property is now worth a hell of a lot more. It's worth a, probably a few million. If that's the case, if you could earn that out of it, that's forced appreciation. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. You can't do that in normal residential property because the, there's no there's no law on that property itself. There's no specific planning uh, consent on that property for that. It's just like yeah, anybody could use it. So mm -hmm. there's no forced appreciation at all on that. Yeah, I think also when it comes to tenants in a property, I, I mean, like I say, legally you don't really need to tell them, but. I think it's a courtesy thing and the reality mm -hmm. is if you've got a tenant in a property and you've got investors or landlords that are going to buy it they're going to before they put an offer in they're going to want to see it in some shape or form they're going to want to cross the door so i mean it's going to raise questions so you've as well been like you say jim be transparent say yeah. it out say it out like this is what's happening and this is like that could go this way it potentially could go this way um and i think that a courtesy to the tenant you should you should uh, kind of follow that rule yeah. there are a few things to think about though if you've got tenants in place obviously you've got a tenancy agreement in place as well can if i just want to jump in and stop you there yeah it's like there's two camps in here mm -hmm. there's what if i tell the tenant and they move out and i'll lose that income okay yeah and it might yeah, not sell as quick and then there's i'm not going to tell the tenant and then i'm going to spring it on at last minute mm -hmm. and i don't i'm just going to take a moral stance on this and say you should tell the tenant straight away yeah because that's unfair to the tenant and the fact that you're just going to spring them on the last minute oh by the way i sold it to how so to show that somebody who's wanting vacant possession holy mm -hmm. shit what that's what gives landlords a bad name you yeah. should make it clear to the tenant in the beginning and and it, and it you know if they move out and find better accommodation or they find the alternative accommodation <coughs> that's quite right they should be allowed to do that yeah. you should be telling them so they can do that to hell with you if you lose lose a couple of months rent you're selling the property they're living in it right now they want security a tenure so they want to move somewhere they, they need to move somewhere else to get that for them and their family and for planning for their future that's just me taking a moral stance on it but that's, no, I, totally, I, I, I do totally that. agree i do agree with that i completely agree with that as well and actually when we are in that situation when we're selling when the tenant is there it's very unsettling for the tenant. You know, they become very vulnerable um, because they don't know if they're going to have a home next month. Yeah. Two months time. Yeah. They have All fear the and vulnerability. Totally. And, and especially if somebody who's in a, a position where they're very anxious uh, and and they, they have a lot of anxiety, you know, basically that just makes it worse for them. 
So it's 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 been a, it's been up front, it's been above board. Um, so I often go in and have that conversation with them myself personally, you know, on behalf of the landlord, yeah. um, for that reason, because the landlord doesn't know how to approach it. So I say, you know, I'll sit down and I will genuinely say to them, look, we are going to try and find somebody who will actually buy it with you here. So don't be too concerned. However, you do have rights under the legislation um, to proper notice to proper, you know, um, under that legislation. So it's not the case that you will be left overnight without a house to go to. If, if somebody wants to buy this and move in for their own their own pleasure as their own um, uh, own house, you have got time to be able to do that. And in the meantime, you know, it's easy for us to possibly find you another property to actually go to or you to find someone else. And every single time that's worked, that's worked very, very well. And it's worked every single time. So, and I can see, I can see why that would be, Jim, because actually what you also need is for your tenant to be on site when you're selling, because while your tenants feel vulnerable, you still need them to be looking after your asset. And so when we want to go and yeah. do photos and videos and viewings, etc., you want the property to be seen in its yeah. best light, and your tenant plays the biggest part in that. Well, they just need to turn around and say, "I'm not letting you in." Yeah, yeah. and we've uh, Perry, we've and had that done few. Uh, do you know what I mean? And and a few that have come to say oh, that I've got tenants in place and. And do you know what I mean? And, and access can be difficult if it's not mm -hmm. set out properly. Um, mm -hmm. And you really need to have that conversation, like Jim says. And, and I've, I've had a few of them, obviously, over the years. You do need to remember there's there's always a tenancy agreement in place. If you want to have access for viewings and things, it should be outlined in your paperwork. Yeah. It should yeah. always be um, approached with a notice period for access for viewings and things as well. If you don't give them the proper notice, they don't need to let you in. And that's something mm -hmm. that you really need to do. And I think to tell your tenant that you're open to selling to other landlords and things as well, like you said, Jim, as uh, you know, be transparent with them. Tell them what the plan is, and tell them yeah, that yeah, if, yeah. if the plan is to keep them in place and sell to another landlord, that's ultimately what we'll try and do. But it might not always transpire like that, yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah. and that way they'll maybe have a bit more reassurance that they might not have to move out. Um, and also settle your tenant's nerves uh, and by reminding them that. A sale usually takes a good few months to go through and things depending on what the situation is so if they do need to move on they've got that time as well do you know what i mean and just providing them all the right information so that they feel comfortable in the position that they are in and yeah. maybe they, yeah. they don't just maybe up and leave or, or whatever it may prompt them to do if things are done right i think if you get this right uh, you should be able to avoid holding an empty property like you say jim without uh, without having a buyer and then having an empty property at the same time while keeping the rental income flowing and um keeping the tenant happy until a sale is actually complete. Yeah, this is quite yeah, a good one to ask Perry. What's the sale value for your rental property? What, you know, how can we do that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a major factor in deciding whether or not to sell your property is absolutely down to how much it's worth, isn't it? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you don't necessarily need to disturb your tenant, as we've just spoken about. Um, there's more than one way to get an idea of your current value as well um, before asking your estate agent to go in and do it. So, you know, we've got tools available to us to give landlords an idea of value. So mm -hmm. definitely that can be done without disrupting your tenant and your potential future. Um, but I think first you can check online sites like Rightmove um, and Zoopla. Um, you can get similar maybe recent nearby sales and give you a feeling for what's similar to yours than what they're selling at just now and give you a general idea of what buyers are paying. So that's a good way to do it. Obviously, you're only getting whatever the asking price is there. You're not confirming exactly what it was sold for, but it gives you a guide at least. So it's something to start yeah. with. Um, I think speaking to a local agent as well for a form, more informed estimate is something that mm -hmm. we would happily do and um, get their thoughts on what the current property market is like. Um, you know, in regards to your property, what are things selling for? Have they got demand for from buyers in that particular location? Um, and that really helps them as well. And that may even have an investor waiting in the wings because we have that, don't we? That's really important, Barry, I think. Mm -hmm. And although it's, you could look online and get a, a rough idea of what pro probably your property is worth, it's so important to have an agent who's on the ground in the area, knows, do you know what I mean, street by street, basically, how mm -hmm. things are performing, what the market's like, and also has the feelers out with potential investors who are looking in the area and things as well you're not going to get that just by obviously jumping online that just will give you a guide but you really need to speak yeah. to an experienced agent to get the the best result i agree we do it ourselves don't we i mean certainly when i'm out at properties if it's a landlord that's currently in situ with the property then the first thing i would do richard is speak to you and say look you've yeah. got this one potentially coming on that would this is it your investor group you've got that investor group you know yeah. what your landlords are looking for so mm -hmm. it's a good way of already getting someone who can potentially snap it up quickly yeah definitely yeah.
definitely. But I think finally as well, if the figures are promising, and that's where you need to really understand your figures, isn't it, and the ins and outs of it, arrange a suitable time for your tenant, with your tenant, sorry, for the estate agent to go out. Yeah. Um, and just give you a precise valuation and, and what your asking price potential would be. Um, I think that's a really positive one as well. But again, it goes back to the previous points we were saying, doesn't it, in regards to the rental part of it, how you deal with that tenant if they are still in situ will determine whether that, that point <laughs> will actually be allowed to happen. Okay, so here's a top tip for anybody out there. It's like, I'm only really wanting a valuation of my property because I'm thinking about remortgaging or I'm thinking about doing something else with it, but I don't want to upset my tenant. Classic example is you get the estate agent out and you, all you de need to say to them, it's, a, it's for insurance rebuild value. Yeah. That's it. I'm, I'm getting the estate agent out. I just need an insurance rebuild value. Mm -hmm. I know that's no technically, because insurance rebuild value is a totally different figure from the valuation of the house. Yeah. However, it just delays the fears because you've got no intention probably of selling anyway or doing anything about it, but you just need to know for your portfolio and for your future mm -hmm. planning for possibly things like inheritance tax or or you know um, or possibly selling later on to a limited company mm -hmm. you need to know your financial position um, so in order not to upset the tenant it's actually just a case of just telling them quite up front it's like we're only looking at for tax planning purposes um, or, or, or an easy one is an insurance valuation that's all mm -hmm. yeah i think it's really important to try and, and pave the way so that your estate agent can go out because getting your estate agent out to have a look at the property as well is a good way for the landlord to understand you know what maybe he or she may need to do to that property mm -hmm. to improve and increase the saleability of it yeah uh, you know that, that's a really big factor as well and there may be some things that you can do that increase your chances of selling it um and also how much you're going to achieve for the property without yeah. inc inconveniencing your tenant. And actually on the other side of that, in fact, an endorsement to say, you don't need to do anything. Your tenant's been fantastic. They've kept the property in a really good p condition. So it'll just go as is. So again, that alleviates a little bit of fear from the landlord who's maybe thinking that they have to spend a bit of investment when actually they don't in the reality. Yeah. This brings me next to my conversation about will, the, will a landlord or a home buyer pay more? And I think I've answered that question, but let's yeah. let's go through it and analyze this. Yeah, yeah, you have you have touched on that, Jim, and, and we're going to talk about it now. But I think if you if you're selling your rental property to a home buyer, you yeah. obviously need to think about obviously giving the correct notice to the tenant and things. Obviously, that's in place, and obviously the completion date mm -hmm. uh, and the concerns uh, of the the buyer's solicitor and things. You need to think about all of that, uh, and that's okay. But you need to you need to explore different options when you're you're obviously selling to a home buyer as opposed to maybe an investor. Um, and start by seeing if your tenant would like to buy the property. That's sometimes, and we've done that a few times mm -hmm. over the years, um, it's potentially the smoothest possible outcome if somebody does decide to sell their rental property. Because the tenant in place might have been there for a long time and might then be in a financial position or maybe in, as maybe in their thought process, I'm going mm -hmm. to buy. And then they might, they, that might just work out perfect because they don't want to move. It's their home. There's been quite a few times you've actually referred to yeah, yeah. financial um, to mortgage brokers in order to see what their situation is financially. Um, so they can see if they could actually get the funding and a lot and, and it's quite a good motivation to do that and the reason for that is even though I know as a landlord you might think because you know the tenant you've got a new you've not got a hope in hell of getting a mortgage it's like let's don't even say that to them uh, just, just ask them, refer them to a mortgage broker let the mortgage broker possibly break the, break the bad news. And that, was, that makes it more palatable for the fact that you've given them first choice of doing it. It's all about it's all about showing your true intentions and the fact that, yes, if you're in a position that you could do something, yes, you can do something. There is a few times where I get, you know, tenants thinking, oh, I've stayed in it for the last five years, so I'm entitled to a discount. It's like, it's not the bloody council housing you get. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's like, but it's not a registered. You suddenly got a right to buy scheme, Jim. Like, but, but that's honestly, that's what people think. Because I paid you rent, I should get a discount. Oh, but you paid a rent for using my capital for renting the property and for me paying for all the bills, for all the repairs and improvements over the years and taking all the risk and actually insuring the property outright. And you were never paying for any of that. Mm -hmm. And you had the date, you had the. The, the the enjoyment of using the property and you can walk away any time at minimal exit costs mm -hmm. that's what you paid for over the years mm -hmm. you didn't pay a, a discount when you're buying it mm -hmm. and no landlord out there should be expected to do that you that's just that's just crazy mm -hmm. to think that you should actually be giving your someone a discount because they stayed in it and they paid your rent for it unless mm -hmm. that's your agreement in the beginning there is people that do 
kind of helped to buy, and it had yeah. existed in the past. I knew Jimmy Taylor, uh, had Taylor Street in the 1930s did that. Um, that was what happened. He he built Taylor Street in Arbor Hill in the 1930s. Apparently, this is what happened. You know, or he's, he's older, he's mother and father and all the rest of it, the original Jimmy Taylor. Um, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is the story. And he had built them all in the 1930s. Obviously, you know what happened in the 1930s, a Great Depression um, throughout the world and all the rest of it. So he decided to actually part rent them and part buy them to, his, to the people that actually lived in them. So he, that's how he sold them originally. He let them rent and buy at the same time with the same money. And not, you know, like for, it's it's like the it's like the help to buy or yeah, the, the, the shared yeah. equity. That's it. It's like the shared equity. I'll allow you. I'll be the mortgage broker. I'll be the bank, and I'll allow you to pay up the mortgage to me with a with a, a an amount of interest on them. And that's what I believe he actually did. That's in the nineteen thirties. And we're hailing this as some new revelation. Some new model. Uh, in the last been. 20 years, it's like, God, they, these people were doing it years and years ago. Mm. They had to be creative in their thinking because they had all their money tied up in property. And at that time, you were never there was never buy to let or anything like that. It was just like, I built these to rent, to, to sell with somebody, not rent to them. So how am I going to get, how am I going to do that now? Because they don't have any, they don't have any means of buying anymore. Mm. I'll become the bank. And I'll sell it to them and let them become the mortgage holder. Uh, let them be the mortgagee and and take it from there. Yeah, I think part of that process, though, if you are selling and you've got a tenant in situ, I think the starting point of just asking them if they would like to, whether they go ahead with it or not, whether they're in a position to or not, the fact that you've asked them anyway will make them feel valued and they'll actually yeah. then be more amenable in the whole process, won't they? Of course. Yeah, definitely. Well, people just want to be included. It, yeah. it's, again, I come back to the fear factor. And, the fa and mm -hmm. if you don't tell people, you know, and you're not a bit more transparent about what your intentions are, then it gives them so much fear. Um, it's, the, it's the false expectations appearing real. It's yeah. like a hundred different scenarios appear in their head about what could happen. Mm -hmm. And only one thing can really happen. And uh, But they go through all that emotional turmoil as a result of it. And that, yeah. that manifests itself um, in terms of you're not getting in to do photographs. I'm away to the shops today. Um, I've got the doctor. My, my kids are ill. Uh, all these different things are, are, are now are now no longer, they're no longer real valid reasons, to be honest. You know, I know I said the kids are ill. And yeah, oh, they are, fair enough. But <laughs> it has been used in the past. I know that, where they've, oh, they've got a cough. It's like yeah. you can't come in. Uh, but it's, it's just an, an excuse to delay it because the, they're, they're fearful of what might actually happen, so they don't want the process to go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you're right what you say, Perry. It will leave them feeling valued. I mean, whether they say yes or no, I mean, if they say no, then obviously then speak to your agent, uh, explore other agencies who are obviously dealing lettings and, and things as well. They might have investors. Do you mean someday to pick it up? But one mm -hmm. thing to be aware of, if you are going to start to look at selling your rental property to another landlord or investor or whatever, make sure your property is compliant in every aspect in terms of certificates and your deposits lodged in a deposit scheme. And, you know, because, I mean, that's things that should be anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, you will get picked. That will be the first questions that, come up um, and if they are not all in place then you're not going to be able to sell that I, and you can find yourself in the water i'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking forward to TikTok. i've got the neggies on <laughs> and they're all making their comments wait till i have a go at you at the end <laughs> yeah we're going, to, we're going to cover questions in a second i but thought yeah, you were make, getting excited about something no yeah but make <laughs> sure they're all some of them are coming up oh it's it's like we'll, we'll have a go at them at the end yeah. Make sure your property is compliant, definitely, and in all aspects, if you're going to be selling it uh, on as a rental property with your tenant in place, it should be compliant anyway. Mm -hmm. um, selling on the open market, use an agent who handles both sales and lettings, just like we spoke about there, Perry. We go back and forward between each other. If you've got people that are coming to you and, and likewise with me, it's always good uh, mm -hmm. to have that. It widens your market for home buyers and landlords, and it's a really good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the majority of agents do do lettings and sales, um, but some don't and it's quite good to use an agent that has both but in so, regards to that i mean the question there was about you know will a landlord or home private home buyer pay more um in terms of who will pay more what is the answer to that jim i thought you were going to ask me <laughs> 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 well you know my thoughts on it that you know the 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 open market will always pay more 
um, the, the, the tenant is usually typically reluctant to pay a lot more than what the valuation of the house is mm -hmm. because that's just one person in the whole hundreds of people that possibly might you know might want to might want to jump uh, mm -hmm. on that property but because it's just to that one person so i i always say the easiest way to do this is actually put your rental property on the market and then give your tenant the chance to actually make a fair offer based on the competition with everybody else mm -hmm. yeah and don't yeah. give them ex don't they, they shouldn't really get exclusivity <laughs> if they're actually trying to ask for a discount or trying to just give you home report value if mm -hmm. you know and your agent's giving you an indication it probably could be worth a, a, a bit more it's it's not fair and uh, to do that um and it's yeah it's not fair to do that at all so i i, I definitely think the person that pays the most it's possibly it's definitely the open market in my in my experience in my opinion mm -hmm. it's it's very rare you'll ever get the tenant paying that amount some people are actually quite happy to exit that though you know you've got a lot of landlords out there and i know a few of them they're actually quite happy just to sell it to their tenant for that value because they've got rent out over the years and also the other thing is is um they've got a good return so in other words it's paid it's paid them um what they wanted for the property so they're happy to exit that they're not they don't want to be I don't I wouldn't say the word greedy but they don't want to some people don't want to appear greedy and it's like and I say to them well hold it you're the one that took all the risk mm -hmm. <laughs> you're the one that you're the one that put all the investment in um nobody was there to say if the price of the property goes down oh I'll 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 chip in with you will you yeah was there to say that. <laughs> you know if the price of the property goes down I'll help you out and I'll chip in as, as a tenant mm -hmm. no <laughs> it's like so why would you expect it to be on the other foot um, where if the landlord's selling and it's the tenant should say, oh, well, I should maybe get a discount. I should just get it for home report value. Mm -hmm. Because as a tenant, you weren't prepared to bail them out of the price that went down. Mm -hmm. So why should it be the other way around than yeah. that? So it's only it's only fair that's the case. Yeah. And in regards to that, then we're talking about kind of the where you'll get more from, but also in your experience with your landlords, Richard, and if they've decided to sell up, are you saying that there's a is there a particular property type? that perhaps sells easier or at the moment i mean for a while there it was two and three bedroom houses were so popular and you know on the back of lockdown and it was just a, a popular kind of model but i see apartments and, and flats and things becoming more popular there's a mix and it just depends on the area and, and what mm -hmm. there's certain properties that are popular in certain areas and things as well flats and apartments are becoming more popular as buy to let investments they're really yeah. popular mm -hmm. with tenants because they are they're becoming more affordable to run you know there's less there's less utility costs there's mm -hmm. the, the um, council tax is lower so we, obviously, obviously everybody's feeling the pinch with the cost mm -hmm. of living and things as well so yeah th there is a mixture and it does it, it runs on area i think certain things are more popular in different areas i guess it depends as well what the landlord's done to the property i mean some of the examples of that obviously you know there's legislations in place where we've got fire doors and lobbies yeah. uh, i mean that, that you know that means there's more cost to somebody as a private buyer, isn't it? Because they're not necessarily yeah. going to want those and want to remove them. So, you know, and for home buyers to remove that, that can be a costly thing. But it's really a convenient time saver, I guess, if you can sell it to another landlord, I guess. And you probably find that with your experience. Yeah. Also, yeah. as I touched on there about making sure your property is, it should be compliant yeah. anyway. But making mm -hmm. sure when you're going at the point of sale, it is compliant and everything's in place. Because mm -hmm. I, I do a lot of property sourcing and look for things for investors and, and per, to purchase. And the main, the one of the main things we look for, obviously, if, especially if it's a running, being a running uh, buy to let property, is does it already have its CICR, which is electrical mm -hmm. safety, it's all smoke alarms in place and things. Because if that's all in place, that's a big selling point because it's less mm -hmm. cost to the new buyer. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. something. CICR to end up, you know, worst case scenario, a full, a full rewire, and a yeah. full rewire means raggling up walls and stuff like yeah. that, which means a full redecoration, and the tenant has mm -hmm. to move out, or hopefully you've caught it before they moved in. Um, so there's a lot of different implications here. And even the new ICRs, when they're done after five years when they expire, they're actually more encumbered now and they're actually a, a higher, Change, yeah. higher point of standard. Um, so that's changed. So that, that then allows you. We've come across it, Richard, the now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's it, really. Um, yeah. That's the most important thing out of it is you have to make sure all the compliance is in place because if it's in place, it's a huge difference to a landlord. Mm, yeah. That's where a landlord will pay market rate um, yeah. because they know there's nothing to do. And if, yeah. the, if the numbers work, I mean, I've often said to people, and I, I have offered actually the market rate because I know the rent they're getting just now is the right return for me. 
Um, mm -hmm. But often, or, you know, I'll go back to a landlord as well and say, you know, I know you do want to sell it. I know you want the tenant to sell it. I know you want an easy exit. And that's fine. But my numbers work at that level at this price point. If that's something you're interested in, fair enough. If it's not, then, you know, I'll, I'll wait for the next person to come along. Yeah. You know, it's no, it's no as if I'm, it's no as if I'm like, oh, I'll have to get that one. I'll have to get this one. I want everything. There's no megalomania. <laughs> <laughs> that was maybe in the early days. Yeah. Um, but I think the important thing as well was to ask your agent, isn't it, and get some good advice. So yeah. I think before we go into next steps, because I can see you're chatting at the bit, Jim, TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got everything prepared. I know my script is coming, what's coming next. Then. Right. Yeah, what I think, yeah, and just, yeah, just to recap, for me, I think that it is on an individual basis, and whether it is part of your journey and that's where you've got to that point and you're selling for that reason, yeah. If you're being influenced by obviously the things that are happening just now and not too sure and on the fence and speak to the right people, if you are going to do that and, and make that decision, make sure you've thought about the financial aspects, the tax implications. There's a lot to consider. And if you're really mm -hmm. unsure, just speak to the right people. We're always happy to help um, or refer you on to the right people that will be able to give you the right information. Just before you jump on your comments, Jim, we've got Margaret jumped in the comments here. She says, our rental property is on the market just now. I wish I'd seen this live chat earlier. The tenants moved out already, and we couldn't, have, and they could, as they couldn't afford to buy it. Uh, if, if the tenants moved out, you've got vacant possession, which means it's a lot more attractive to a bigger yeah. audience now. Um, and that that is the point. Um, it, it's all about it's all about your digital marketing strategy next, mm -hmm. and then you, the negotiation um, at the end of this. How strong a negotiator you um, either yourself or your estate agents are on your behalf, whoever's representing you of the art. Um, that's that's the key. That's where you'll add the value at the end of this um, and, and actually reach the right people. Because there's been a rental property before, it'll be highly attractive to possibly yeah, somebody yeah. that wants to enter the rental market. Remember, the difficulty is, when you've been in the market like me for a long time, you've seen the, the glory days where it was really good returns. Uh, and then they've now got to a situation where it's been, it's been cut and cut and cut. And you go, maybe it's not worth my effort anymore. But what you've got to realise is there's people on the sidelines waiting to enter the market because they like the returns that they're actually getting today. Mm -hmm. So there's always somebody ready to take your place as a as a landlord. You know that's yeah. the reality. Um, mm -hmm. But it's how it's how long. It, the the key here is for the government is actually to make sure they actually get people to replace the existing stock or they have to replace the existing stock themselves because the finite amount of people in rental property is always going to be the same more than likely. Um, yeah. They're always going to need rental property that, for that particular reason. So if the government's not building any rental property, then there's nothing to replace them with. So people will go homeless mm -hmm. and they'll have to live in scatter flats and mm -hmm. scatter accommodation, which is temporary, which is not good for a family. It's not good for the children's education. It's not good for the children's health. It's not good for anybody's well-being and, and, and mental welfare. And um, mm -hmm. that doesn't solve anything getting rid of private landlords. It's stupidity at its best. It is the height of ignorance is doing the same thing every single time, but it's actually expecting a different result. And that's where we are right now in this sort of political sphere of housing. They just don't understand what they're doing. There's no commercial acumen because they're all academics come out from, you know, some uh, university or college or privileged uh, position. And they've actually just gone straight into politics with actually no commercial reality of how business works, how the social sphere works, uh, how, um, how society works either. They, they, they've been in this bubble for their whole life. Um, that's the difficulty. That's the difficulty, I would say. Margaret, Margaret said, thanks, Jim. Um, she said that she worked in social renting housing for 15 years. Perhaps I should give the local authority or housing associations a call. Housing associations yeah, are, local are, are picking up properties. Um, local, local authorities are competing against first-time buyers right now mm -hmm. because yeah. they're, they're buying stock from, the, from our market, from normal residential sales market, um, to add to their social housing stock. So you could go, yay, social landlords. It's like, wait a minute, you just castigated us for buying properties from the pri from the, for the private renting sector and taking them away from first-time buyers, but we're no castigating the council for doing the same thing. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, exactly. And Jim, actually, and Margaret says there, you know, it's a three-bed ex-local authority property. Yeah, highly popular we, with them. We actually sold um, a property to Fife Council last week. So it is currently happening. So, you know, that, we've, that got, we've got a direct you. contact um, in the Fife uh, to the right people and within there to actually be able to uh, do that deal and make that happen. And we can negotiate with them where they tend not to negotiate with the general public. Yeah. yeah. There's a point. 
there is there is there is a plus a real added value um, mm. for for doing it that way because a lot of people think we can just go straight to the council and then the council will just take advantage of it and <laughs> screw them. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go, oh, I sold it. And I hear this all the time where people, oh, I sold it to the council. And I'm like, my first thought is, hello, I'm an estate agent. Why would you not just come to me? And the thing, it's like, oh, I've saved so much money in my stage. The fees, and I went, well, you've lost a fortune. Because, you, <laughs> because they've basically whitewashed you and they've basically just walked all over you. And you've got no idea how they've negotiated you out of thousands that you possibly could have got at the end that we would have got for you. False economy. Anyway, Absolutely. let's go. Let's We're talking about next steps. Well, um, yeah. So, what's your thoughts <laughs> on this? And we'll we'll go to questions um, on the on the platforms and just uh, see what our thoughts are on it. Well, of course. I mean, obviously, we've had we've had Richard's thoughts on there. I think for me, I know we talk about the building and the house and what have you. But Jim, you kind of touched on it there. And for me, the biggest factor in this is understanding what everybody's journey is, what is your end goal. Um, but we have to be mindful that. This is just not a building at this point because it's a rental that you're selling that has a tenant in it. And we do need to factor in that individual that's living there. You know, yeah. it's their home. Um, so there's a lot of emotional connection to it with them. So I think getting good advice from an agent that can help you handle that situation is paramount at the beginning to just make that journey run smoothly for everybody concerned. Yeah. So for me, um, just be kind in the process as well. I know it's a yeah. monetary transaction, but there's people involved very much so in this. And that would be kind of my thoughts on it, really. There's, there's people involved in everything, Perry. That's that's yeah. the key here. And it doesn't matter what you do. There's always somebody involved. Um, you know, I think we've given the best advice possible in order to approach it based on my personal experience over the years, mm -hmm. uh, being, a, being an investor for a landlord for, for the 30 years. So I know what actually works and I know how to alleviate the situation, how to take that fear out of anywhere. Um, I would definitely say that. Um, Margaret, just to say that finally, and that's me, that's my final words on it, but Margaret, um, yes, Angus Council will have somebody within the Angus Council who actually would consider your property. Um, and yes, they will pay above market value, but you have to know what you buttons to push to, them to do that. Yeah, yeah, you have to know what buttons to push to do that. Um, let's go and let's go into other questions. Okay, let's just have right, a quick look. Okay. Here. And comments and stuff like that because I, I need to I, I need to just make sure we're just rolling through um yeah i, I agree with you chad uh, chad hogan has actually said everything is against the landlords just now uh, effectively that's what it is the legislation is all designed to castigate landlords um we're now being uh, i kind of said we used to be vilified before but it's almost like pitchforks and you know torches um and and a, and a noose running yeah, for the nearest tree and yeah. in, in order to string a landlord up that's the kind of approach that the the government is actually putting forward in terms of their mentality, in terms of how they're uh, how they're um, whipping up the public um, or, or the, the certain groups in the public uh, sphere about who landlords are and and what they are. And it's like, wait a minute, um, but I'm a landlord, um, you know. So okay, so that's me you're talking about, if that's mm -hmm. the case. And and so is so is Margaret. And and you know so are other, so they're all landlords. All the people around about you are landlords. That you know that there's I think there's about one in ten, two in ten, or something like that in, in the whole of Britain that's are, are investors and landlords. So they're all landlords. The local authority is a landlord, by the way. Yeah. Um, and and so is the social housing associations as well. They're all landlords as well. So we're all been vilified to a degree um, from certain groups, and this is where social media. And where society is asking the intelligent to shut up to appease the idiots. But that's the thing, though. The idiot doesn't know they're an idiot. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's well, amazing. Always, and I hate to say it, and I'm not calling anybody that, but there's a well-known phrase that I always know is, pigs don't know pigs stink. Yeah. <laughs> and that applies to me sometimes as well, by the way. <laughs> Um, so Chad again says, what is the government doing to keep landlords should be the question. Uh, they're probably doing that's, absolutely nothing yeah, at this point. That's a good time. question, but we probably know the answer, yeah. Yeah, they, they needed a lot of landlords years ago, and George Osborne had the fantastic idea about being able to put your residential property in a pension, and the day before it was due to be introduced, and everybody was lined up to put residential properties into pensions, he went, oh, I've changed my mind. Because <laughs> he realised that... The, the 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 huge uh, impact it would have on on the existing okay. housing uh, uh, system in other words a lot of properties actually would have been definitely taken the housing system for tax advantages and put into pensions 
um, and that's not that wasn't a good idea. Um, however, um, that's what happened. But uh, Chad, they're not doing anything just now. They're more or less just thinking we should tighten up, we should tighten up, we should put more regulation and all the rest of it. But in actual fact, the number of and I'll and I'll quote this: the number of rogue landlords in the whole of Britain, according to the government, represents of the landlord population point zero zero five percent. That's no one percent. That's point zero zero five percent of the landlord population, according to the government statistics, because I know these and I've been privileged of them, um, is is what they classify as rogue landlords that they need to get rid of. Mm. So it's a sledgehammer to crack enough. Oh, thank you. I'm very good looking. They'll be messaging me next. Would you like to see pictures? <laughs> Would you like to see pictures? <laughs> <laughs> That's what probably come next, eh? Um, uh, Barry says, I've got two properties which I bought with no mortgage, but gave, but gave life tenancy to someone. Um, they get the rent. Uh, what best for me to do? All right, okay. I think I think I know what is it. Okay. So Barry, if, if I'm getting this right, you I know it's limited what you can see on that platform and your comments, which I bought no mortgage. So you've got a, you've got two properties, no mortgages, and you've basically said to the tenant when they moved in, look, you could stay here forever. I've not got an issue with this. It's just a it's just a regular income for me. Uh, enjoy the house, tell me when there's problems, and I'll come and sort them and, and you can have the enjoyment for the house for the rest of your life. Um they get the rent, in other words. I think I, I'm going to assume here that they're universal credit, so they get the rent. Yeah, I was just going to say that. What is best for me to do? Well, if your tenant's passing on the rent every single time, nothing. Just leave it as it is. That's okay. If your tenant goes one month and one day into arrears, that's technically under the guidelines for the DWP. Direct two payment. Months in a, two months in arrears because because your lease should be set up to pay a month in advance every single time. So if they go one day in one month, then they're two months in arrears. Now, when they go into two months in arrears, the DWP guidelines back in the 19, no, early, mid-2000s is when I was advisor at the National Landlords for Scotland. Um, when they go two months in arrears, technically, then the DWP guidelines say that you should actually you should actually apply to Universal Credit. Now you will be able to do that and put an application and say you would like the property the, the rent paid direct because it's putting their tenancy and uh, their their tenancy is becoming now vulnerable. In other words, their position because you're now racking up rent arrears. So you put an application in to have it paid direct for that reason. Other than that, if they're paying their money direct, then then feel free. You know, just keep just keep letting them do that because there's nothing wrong with that. Margaret, Margaret's messaging. She's needing to leave. Mar Margaret, I'll drop your message later and we can touch base if you want. Yeah. To so this. the other one is Barry said, uh, could I remortgage both and buy another two, taking into account the above? If you've not got any mortgages on them, yes, you can actually reconsider uh, um, getting the mortgages on them. However, you've got to worry about the tax implications if they're in your name personally. Because you'll only get a lower rate deduction uh, for the tax credit on the actual interest only element. So, the interest in the year is £10,000. You'll get a £2,000 deduction tax credit against your tax bill when it's calculated before the mortgage is taken off. So, in other words, if your mortgage is £10,000 and your income is £20,000 before the mortgage, you'll be taxed on £20,000 first and then you'll have £2,000 taken off that tax bill. So you can see if you're a higher rate payer and you're maybe earning 50,000 out of that, you'll be taxed at the higher rate and you'll only get the lower rate taken off of that. So you will actually still, you'll pay more tax in your own name. If you're a limited company, uh, um, then it's a different regime. It's corporation tax. Uh, if you're and if you're under 50,000 profits next year, you'll still be taxed at the lower rate. Whereas if you're over 50,000 profits, there's a tapered relief up to 250,000 under corporation tax rates, then you'll pay 25% overall um, on your tax bill. Um, and then you've got to pay to get the money out on dividends, but that's 8.75 on the basic rate payer. Uh, and you're allowed, just now, you're allowed the first 2,000 dividend tax free, but it's going to go down to 1,000 next year and then 500 the year after. That's another way the government's getting more money. Um, so it just depends on your whole personal setup. Um, 
So you can remortgage, yes, but it depends. And also it depends. You can't remortgage even though you're not earning anything because some mortgage companies now have done away with it. You've got to earn 25000 minimum in order for us to remortgage. Um, they've done away with that recently. There's no income requirement anymore because buy to let is viewed as, buy to let properties are viewed as self-financing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's not part of your income that you look at. It, it's something else. Okay. Uh, oh, capital gains rates. I was actually going to uh, show that on the screen. I found it. So capital gains rates uh, in here, uh, according to the rules, here we are. Uh, capital gains allowance changes for the landlord's second homeowners. Uh, Jeremy Hunt announced in the autumn statement 2022, which is what I was talking about, capital gains allowance of 12300 is being halved to £6,000 from April 23. But then if you've got a spouse, you'll both get six each. So you'll get 12 still. And then cut out again. Uh, cut again to 3,000 from April 2024. Um, so again, if you've got a spouse, it'll be 6,000 if you can use it that way. Um, but your, your basically capital gains is going to disappear. They'll take, that's a token gesture just to take it away eventually. Uh, next one is, uh, I've got MS saying join living rent. I, I was actually quite terrified when I saw this and I looked it up. Here's living rent right here. And it's actually just people uh, jumping on there. New deal for tenants, rents down, rates up, housing is a human right, join the fight for decent, affordable, secure housing for all. Well, I agree completely with yeah. decent, affordable and secure housing for all. I absolutely agree with that. And yes, you can talk about uh, living rent and all the rest of it. Um, but you've got to realise as well, now this is just overall, you've got to realise that you have to make a profit in order for the landlord to reinvest in the property. So we can talk till the cows come home about that, but it's actually quite concerning. At, at yeah, people if you scroll down, go on. Could you scroll down for again? People, homes for That's people. What just what well, you absolutely agree. Homes are for people, but you have to make a profit in order to reinvest. That's the point. If you're not making a profit as a business or any business, and we can call it a business, we can call it a social landlord if you like because that's what a social landlord does. They're still in it for the profit because they need the profit in order to reinvest, in order to actually upgrade the stock, in order to look after the tenant, in order to make sure the tenant's property is in good condition so they have safe, secure property. So absolutely, I've got every agreement that people have a right to a affordable, um, decent home and a good standard of living. But But it it has to come from somewhere without obviously disclosing things, but I mean, the amount of money we've spent upgrading your portfolio in recent years <laughs> is, I mean, but we would never be able to do that without making a profit. Yeah, I, I, well, I, you have to make a profit in order to reinvest, in order to upgrade property. It just doesn't come from thin air. There is, like the Chancellor says, hey, there's no magic money tree. Yeah. <laughs> I got a clout across the year from my dad one time when I was younger when, I said, <laughs> when he said, money doesn't grow on trees. And I went, well, money's actually paper, and paper actually comes from trees. And then that's when they went, because <laughs> <laughs> for being sarcastic. Now, you can think that's a six-year-old laddie telling you that as an adult. <laughs> yes, of course money grows on trees, because it, it's paper. It's like, shut up. <laughs> um, uh, the next one, uh, let me talk about uh, now. Okay. Uh, and, and then the same person goes on to say landlordism is criminal. I'm glad you've got a statement for it called landlordism. Um, I don't really know what that ism it's, it's, is. That's the first um, one. Yeah. Being a landlord isn't isn't. It's not. Well, first of all, show me the criminal act. It actually says that. Yeah, crickets and tumbleweed. Tumbleweed. Yeah, that, yeah. That tumbleweed. Um, <laughs> it's like there is no criminal act to tell you that. Landlordism has been going on for uh, since time began. You know, when you go way back to the, you know, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, the kings and the queens actually let allowed people to stay in their homes for a return um, and, and, and their, in their community and that they were surrounded by walls for looking after these people. And that was called taxes at that time. You know, that's what happened. Landlords has been around for years, you know, being a landlord. Um, and, and I'll then challenge you and say, let's compare you and what you've done for people against what I've done for people as well. So over the years, the 30 years I've been, I have housed and looked after thousands and thousands and thousands of people to make sure that they had a stable and secure and safe environment in order to allow their, them and their families to grow up and be the best that they can be. 
often finding them jobs and actually advising them in their financial situation so they could actually get out of the poverty trap and actually taking a lot of hits and lost rent and writing off in order for them to move on and and be better for their future because I knew it would benefit them for their future. Their betterment, yeah. What have you done? That's exactly right, nothing. Uh, plus the fact that the hundreds <laughs> of uh, yeah hundreds of thousands of pounds I've given away over the years to help people in the local community and local causes in order to do that. Um, so I think personally, it's probably one of the most altruistic things that you can do is actually to take the money that really is yours and actually reinvest it in someone else's future in order to help them be the best person they can be. Yeah. I think that's what landlordism, as you're explaining, is all about. Now, I'll wait on your reply. I'm not going to wait just now, but you can write it later on, and then I'll broadcast it on the Wealth Creation Show, what your reply would be to what you've done for your community and the people around about and the thousands of people that you've helped over the years. But I don't think that's probably going to come. And that's it. Can landlords put up rent if there is no contract or tenancy? No, you cannot. You have to put you have to give everybody under the law. That's when you are not a landlord, that's when you're breaking the law and you are actually a criminal. Yeah. Because you're breaking the law. Every tenant should have a contract of the tenancy. In Scotland, it's the PRT, the Private Residential Tenancy Agreement. In England, it's a short assured tenancy, um, as it stands just now, which will probably be changed to something similar to the PRT uh, we've got in Scotland over time. But no, you have to do that. That is one of the, and I'm not saying you've probably done that. He's probably just asking that question, so I'm no castigating you, Barry. Um, that's exactly why Patrick Harvey has taken this draconian um, approach and vilified all landlords uh, from the Greens because yeah. the landlord that he had refused to give him a contract when he was younger um, in his days. And what happened um, with him was he lost his job. And because he didn't have a tenancy agreement, he wasn't able to claim housing benefit to pay his rent to his landlord. And his landlord still wouldn't give him a, a tenancy agreement so he could claim the housing benefit. Therefore, he fell into arrears and the landlord took all the doors off his property and just basically invited them to leave. Which is which is criminal. That's a legal yeah, eviction. Yeah, criminal. definitely. Um, and that should never be tolerated. People like that should be thrown in jail. Um, and people like that should never be landlords in the first place. Um, but they are very few and far between. It's very rare you ever get somebody like that ever now because of the legislation that's in place as a result. And because of people like us, Richard, you know, the fact is we won't do business with people like that. No, if, no. As soon as we, if, if, if we, and um, you know, initially. You know, you can pull the wool over our eyes for maybe a certain period of time, but, you know, as soon as we get wind that you're not the type of landlord that we should have, you're dropped like a stone. Yeah. We're, we're not going to entertain you from now on, and we'll advise your tenant exactly what their rights are and what they should be doing in order to get you. That's that's my opinion, because you should never have been a landlord in the first place. So, yeah. if you're that type of landlord, you probably never appear on our doorstep. No. And if that, if, if I'm ever... If it ever becomes knowledge that that is the situation, then that is definitely the stance and the approach yeah. I would take. And, La and Barry said another thing. He's breaking the law all over the place, which makes me believe Barry's talking bullshit. <laughs> 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 so he's uh, no, so in other words, he's just he's just winding it up. <laughs> he says you are right, and I want to make it right. No, you don't, Barry. You're just winding it up. <laughs> You're a typical TikTok user. <laughs> anyway, that's that's right, us. Okay. Um, no, that yeah, was really good. Um, uh, covered a lot to today. speak to Margaret offline as well, Richard. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll drop. Margaret's left. She had to go, but I just said that before she left, I'll message her direct and and give her any pointers she needs. Uh, thanks for joining, Perry. It was yeah, good. To and he just advice. confirmed one hundred percent true. <laughs> <laughs> so <he> just wrote. <laughs> if anything, live on TikTok gives us uh, a good ending to go through the, the comments. But, uh, but yeah, thanks uh, to both you guys and everybody who's jumped in and uh, interacted. Thank today. you. It makes it really interactive and, and makes it a better show. Jim and I will be 
Uh, here, Monday, 12.30, the Wealth Creation Show, we are doing Wealth Orientated Mindset. It's going to be a good one, Jim. Uh, so yeah, Barry, we right. appear on the Wealth Creation Show Monday at 12.30. <laughs> 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 right, I'm, I'm going to end that there and uh, say bye, everybody, and thanks, guys, again. Bye, bye for now.